At SIGGRAPH 2020, more than 10,000 individuals from 95 countries gathered virtually to experience over 350 hours of content presented by more than 1,600 contributors. What resulted was pure SIGGRAPH. Robotic advances use subtractive fabrication techniques to carve foam and similar materials like an artist. Modeling and predictive computation creates a more robust and accurate time step. Hello, everyone. Welcome to class four of the Introduction to Ray Tracing course. Uh, let me read this uh, ACM SIGGRAPH policy against harassment. This live stream is moderated by ACM SIGGRAPH. We ask that all comments be respectful of others and respect ACM's policy against harassment. This means to exercise consideration and respect in your speech and actions, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in your speech, and please be mindful of your fellow participants. All right, so welcome to class four. And um, last time um, we covered um, scenes and then uh, how to make a little bit more of a complex scene in using a recursive method because um, GLSL doesn't allow recursion. We unroll the loop and then try to make um, six spheres uh, around other six spheres and uh, make a snowflake-like object. Um, today, we're going to cover materials and BRDF. So there's not going to be a whole lot of coding today because I want to build up uh, some base for you. Um, and then next time, we will bring everything together and uh, look at uh, how things are. Um, so today, we'll have uh, a guest, Brent Burley from Disney Animation Studios. And we'll recap and then talk about uh, materials. So uh, today's presentation is again available in the Google Drive. Uh, just uh, go link to it, and you can follow along. Or just uh, you don't probably need to, but you can just follow along with me. So uh, our guest today is Brent Burley. Brent is a principal engineer at Walt Disney Animation Studios, and uh, he has uh, done a lot of important work um, at the studio. <clears throat> including PTEX, SE Expression, and Disney BRDF. He is also the originator of the Hyperion renderer. So for uh, 23 years at Disney Animation, I've had like front row seats to the genius of Brent Burley. And um, I've seen him tackle complex um, problems and provide elegant and uh, innovative solutions to those uh, throughout these years. So it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend, Brent Burley. Hi, Brent. Hi. Thank you, Rajesh, for the nice introduction and for including me in your course. This is uh, my pleasure, actually. So um, I wanted to um, talk to you about a um, um, lot of different things. I think typically um, you've done a number of things um, um, at the studio. Um, but today's topic is about materials and BRDF, and that is one of your expertise. Um, and um, let's get started with just a brief introduction about like um, uh, how you came to be at Disney, what kinds of things you've done, and how you got interested in rendering. OK, so I came to be at Disney just by chance. I mean, it, it was certainly a company I wanted to work for, but uh, I worked at Hughes Aircraft, and they moved to Texas. And I found a job at Philips Media, and they closed the studio. But fortunately, people I'd worked with before had moved to Dix Disney. And so I had a connection, and that helped me get to the studio. But I've always loved Disney. Of course, I grew up with Disney, and I've always loved graphics. And uh, it was just a great opportunity. I jumped at it. That's awesome. I think Obviously, I like it because I've been here. It'll be 25 years next month. Right. That's an amazing tenure. And then um, 
talk a little bit about like how you got interested in rendering um, uh, and then uh, what other kinds of things um, do you do at work? Yeah, so uh, 25 years ago, I never would have imagined I was working on a renderer, let alone creating a new one. But it seems like a number of things have just led to that place. Uh, I tend to gravitate towards uh, challenges, puzzles, problems, and in particular things that I see as a perceived need, uh, where there's you know some pain point for the artists, the users, or uh, you know something I think I can help solve. I think it started it, you know of course we're using RenderMan, and I learned everything I could about that and. Uh, we had issues with texture maps and problems with server load, and that led to PTEX as a solution. I had no idea I would end up writing a new texture format, but right. that seemed to be the well, best solution. If you don't, um, know about PTEX, can you describe a little bit uh, what it is and uh, how we use it? Uh, the way we were doing texture assignment, we came from a NURBS world where you had these parametric patches are all rectangular and the UV mapping is intrinsic, it's obvious. And then when we moved to uh, subdivision surfaces around the Chicken Little time frame, uh, subdivision surfaces also have parametric patches, but there's a lot more of them typically. You know, instead of hundreds, you may have tens of thousands on a character or a or maybe even more than that on a you know a larger set piece. And our UV assignment was still making these rectangular patches, and we just had a crazy number of files. And I was I tried all kinds of things. I tried putting all the files in a zip file and pulling it down on demand, but that was too much data. It worked pretty well otherwise, and then I made it uh, multiple files for different MIP levels, and that was too hard to manage in the cache. And I don't know, I, I tried a lot of things and uh, ended up just making a new format where you, each face is a different texture, but they can all be in one file, solve the IO problem. And then it also it is sort of a secondary benefit that it, it removed a setup step. So that was right. really, not the original goal, but even though that may seem to be the most obvious feature. Right, and then today I think we use it almost everywhere uh, in production, and um, and then uh, I think that um, um, led to your next um, innovation in the BRDF area. And um, I know you did a lot of uh, research on the existing BRDFs and uh, measured BRDFs. Can you describe a little bit of how? that process worked? Yeah, let me back up just a second because the need for this was less obvious, mm -hmm. but there was a trend about that time, 2010 forward, like physically based shading started getting its own course at SIGGRAPH. There was a lot of work being presented. It was obvious to me that we should be looking into it. And we'd done physically based hair shading that was really successful, uh, but our our uh, shaders otherwise were really ad hoc and they were growing out of control. They had a ridiculous number of parameters, and maybe the biggest problem was the look artist would set up the shader according to you know a look approval, and they'd have lighting specifically for that look turntable. And once it got to lighting, the materials didn't look the same anymore. And so they would often have to send things back to look and if things got handed off, they didn't know what the parameters did. And so the benefits we were seeing with hair shading seemed like we should be able to do that in general. And so I just looked like, okay, well, what do we do? How do we do that? And there were, you know, dozens of BRDF models and there was no clear winner, no obvious choice. There wasn't like, oh, just use this and it'll be great. You know, so I started on this journey. It's like, well, how do I even compare BRDF models? I want something that looks like real materials. And uh, I, I became aware of the Merle material database. Mitsubishi 
research laboratory had a hundred measured materials and you could download the data. So I, I uh, then I, I got the data, didn't know what to do with it. And so I ended up uh, with, with a colleague writing a uh, viewer, the BRDF Explorer, that could load the MERL data and I could implement and compare existing BRDF models and start to tease apart and understand like which ones were fitting the data and which ones weren't. And also there were materials in the MERL database that none of the BRDFs seemed to represent well. And I was, I really uh, piqued my interest. Like what is it about the materials that don't fit any BRDF? What are, where are the BRDFs missing? That, that started the exploration. I didn't, at the time I didn't know I was gonna come up with a new model or you know, present something with, that would have the impact it has on the industry. That was a pretty big surprise, but now I think uh, it's influenced a lot of uh, film and also game here to work. So I think then looking at um, um, the MERL database and then so what you try to come up with more of um, analytical solutions rather than have be, be like some table based thing. Um, I, I'm not, I just want to do what works. Uh -huh. you know, I don't care what I have to do. Uh, and if I can find something that works and use it, great. If a table works, great. But that, you know, has its limitations. The more dimensions you get, the less practical it is. And trade-offs with re resolution and so on. Uh, analytic BRDF is preferable, especially one that, that can be sampled well, if not perfectly. Uh, but also something that could be controllable. Like artists have to be able to adjust things. It should be intuitive. And uh, yeah, so it led to just a bunch of choices and decisions and a little bit of innovation. Right. Oh, that's awesome. And then uh, also then I want to talk about um, Hyperion Render itself. Um, just a little bit of a backstory of um, how you came up with the idea in, uh, and how we built it um, over the years. So for a long time before Hyperion, there had been a progression of increasing realism using RenderMan. Uh, you know, it's an amazing tool and it has a huge feature set. And we used every feature that was in there. Uh, there was a trend towards doing more indirect lighting that's computed rather than faked with fill lights. That was uh, typically done with point clouds. And that was a pain point in production. It, it took a lot of uh, data. It took pre-processing time, so it slowed iterations. Uh, they were difficult to manage. You know, there's some artifacts, there's like storage issues. It was just a, a management problem. And, you know, Arnold was an inspiration, but also RenderMan started getting uh, like steadily improving ray tracing capabilities. And there's, there was, I think it was a radiosity cache and there were other features aiming at like, can we do ray trace global illumination? It wasn't path tracing yet, but it was just, you know, can we at least get one bounce of indirect diffuse? That would have been enough. And, uh, you know, that was a start. But even to do that with the scenes of our scale, when we wanted to ray trace, the scenes didn't fit in memory. And that was a pain point, different pain point for artists. You have to break up the scenes in different pieces. You have to be able to, do things in a way where you have layers that can be composited, where you, you know, the interaction between the layers isn't critical. And that just really complicates things. So one question was, could we ray trace, you know, the, the complexity of the scenes that we wanted to be able to render, which meant at the time keeping it all in memory. The other problem we ran into with RenderMan was, it's not render man's fault per se, it's just the reality of indirect rays uh, access data in an arbitrary, almost random order because you know, ray hits something and it, it can go any direction and it needs to evaluate. You, if you're not pre-computing a cache everywhere, it needs to be able to evaluate textures on that ray hit. 
And we use a lot of textures, especially with PTEX, which enabled you know, a vast increase in the amount of textures that we did. And that was becoming an unusable bottleneck. Like as soon as we turned on texture lookups on indirect ray hits, our performance just tanked. So those problems, you know, kept me thinking, you know, just is there a way to solve this? And the inspiration I drew was RenderMan was really fast with the Reyes algorithm and streaming over the geometry. It could rasterize and shade extremely quickly. So I was thinking, what if we had all the rays in memory and just stream the geometry through for each bounce? And uh, then we could shade coherently. Uh, that was enough of a spark of an idea to start an investigation. Ultimately, that wasn't a great idea. I think uh, you know that in its naive form isn't really practical, but what it did lead to in Hyperion was the use of extremely large batches of rays that we sort for shading coherence. We, we also sort them for traversal coherence, and that also helps, but that wasn't the thing that made it unrenderable. It's really the shading coherence that we needed for the amount of texturing that we do. And, and uh, there was also a goal to do out of core rendering and we had that and it was complicated and it was a pretty big performance penalty. And now that we have enough memory, you know, we, we don't use the out of core, core mode anymore. But back in 2012 uh, with Big Hero 6, uh, we had scenes that didn't fit in memory. Okay. Or at least at the point where you need to be able to render it to see, you know, what you needed to reduce. Like there were stages where we had to run out of core. That's, that's great. Um, and uh, what kinds of things are you working on now, if you can tell about it? Uh, one project, which was a pain point that finally bubbled to the surface, was uh, coming up with a more efficient way to render fractured subdivision surfaces for the effects department. Uh, that was just always a, a heavy, painful process, and there were a lot of shading artifacts. And uh, so I've been working on a lightweight process that. Uh, has full shading and, and much fewer artifacts. Yeah, so that's one of the recent things I'm working on. Right. No, that's awesome. So um, in, in the last few minutes, um, can do you have any advice for um, people listening to this uh, class uh, who are just getting into the field and want to learn more, like any resources you recommend or any um, app that uh, they should take? Uh, I have a few things that I thought about. I would say the top of the list is become familiar with machine learning. I think it, it's not used widely in production rendering yet, but there's a huge amount of research <clears throat> happening in this area. And it's virtually certain that it's going to impact production rendering and, and help advance things. Uh, we do use machine learning in our denoising. And you know, there's there's research of how it, it can go into rendering, but it's early days. And I, I think just as programming has become so commonplace that they even teach you know preschool kids to code nowadays. Like everyone should learn to code. I think there will be a time where everybody should learn you know, at least how machine learning works and maybe be able to use it in some way. So it's it's not gonna replace everything. I think it's a tool in the toolbox and understanding what it can and, and also importantly, what it can't do will be very important for everybody starting their career now. Uh, second point is, I think if you're interested in rendering, you should, as much as you can, learn how to use existing renderers you know, there's certainly renders that are free for academic use or entirely free. Uh, use them, use existing assets, see what you can do, understand the artist's experience, find the pain points, what's 
slow or painful or difficult or confusing. Those are the areas where innovation is going to happen. And uh, if you want to know if you want to be a rendering engineer, I would say uh, find a recent paper, you know, something from the current or recent SIGGRAPH or, or you know, Eurographics, and try to implement it in Mitsuba or Cycles or an existing renderer, and you'll that'll be a feel for what it's like to be a rendering engineer. Then um, what about the advances like, that are happening in the um, rendering side with uh, new hardware uh, like RTX? Um, so that seems exciting. And do you think they'll ever reach um, a quality where you can do real-time rendering? People disagree on that. Uh, I think most people think it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the safe bet because, you know, who's to say how long that is? I think it's also a little bit fuzzy because, you know, GPUs and CPUs in some ways are increasingly similar with like massive core counts and SIMD and, you know, levels of caches and so on. Um, I think the biggest change has been the RTX hardware has really uh, reduced the cost of tracing rays. What's still unsolved, in my opinion, is efficient shading on the GPU, at least in the production complexity. Uh, but I think, a, you know, some combination of that and machine learning, people will be able to do real-time filmmaking. I, it, it's uh, controversial, though, whether in the foreseeable future, you know, a studio like Disney Animation would be able to do the shading that we do in real time mm -hmm. i think there's always more demands like the bar keeps raising right and uh like we're doing fiber level or at least yarn level rendering of cloth and you know we're adding a lot of procedural geometry to surfaces even just like the little uh vellus hairs that you get on your skin just to give that a uh, little bit of sheen on characters you can't see the hairs but they contribute Sometimes you can see them, but I think that level of detail is just increasing, at least for now, like that's, that trend doesn't seem to be ending. Volume rendering incredibly intensive is continuing, you know, and I think artists will, will for production rendering will continue to do as much as they can within, you know, the several hours per frame range which is kind of practical for production mm -hmm. so yeah we're, we're definitely working on, on rtx cards and and working on interactive rendering and that's a really important way to preview things uh, but it's not clear yet if or when final rendering for films like ours will be on the gpu you know solely but you know there are gpu renderers and it could definitely be wrong and then machine learning is is the the big uh, disruptive unknown just waiting right. too. No, it's so. a time to be in the field that, that advances are happening pretty quickly. And both machine learning and hardware, and uh, even new research that's coming out of SIGGRAPH and other conferences. It's been awesome. So uh, thank you so much for uh, being uh, with us on um, this class and um, giving us some insight into um, what actual production rendering needs and requires. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, so that was Brent. So I have links to um, some of the work spearheaded by Brent uh, at the studio. Uh, you can go to these links and find out more. So uh, let's uh, dive into the course where we left off last time. So I had um, assigned as homework uh, for you to um, make some interesting scenes. And um, we have a few entries. Um, and as promised, um, uh, I was going to send you, um, whoever did the best ones, to uh, send them a book uh, from uh, courtesy of NVIDIA about ray tracing gems. 
um, and I'll do that. So let's uh, choose the winner. So if you are online, uh, just um, vote for one of these. You can follow the links and um, go see the shaders uh, themselves. But um, if you want to vote now, uh, just um, vote for one, two, three, or four. And by the end of the class, I'll, I'll do my own weighted input and uh, award the book to the winner. So again, great job. Uh, I think we have a very simplistic uh, renderer um, as of now, um, but uh, uh, some of these are really amazing with the animated um, uh, effects. And, and I think one of them even um, had a different shader, but they put in the quadric intersection. So it's pretty cool to see. Um, and then keep doing that. I think we'll um, keep making more complex scenes. And as we do a little bit more efficient rendering, then we can add in a few more objects. So then it becomes easier to uh, manipulate those objects. Um, again, great job, all four of these. Um, so go ahead and type one, two, three, or four in the chat, and then um, I'll choose a winner towards the end of the class. All right. So last time, um, we covered texture mapping. And uh, texture mapping, uh, uh, you can think of it as um, a simple um, uh, two-value input into a texture, U and V. And that's the coordinates that um, uh, you can uh, get from the texture. It's a flat map. Um, and then you take your object and find um, the x, y, z point on the object and then do a mapping from the texture onto the object. For sphere, um, this is the formula that I provided. Um, and uh, it, it's a decent um, wrapping around the sphere. Uh, it does distort at the poles, and then it um, kind of condenses everything to a single point. Uh, but it kind of spreads out um, the rest of it around the sphere. Uh, so for doing any kind of texture mapping, you would need some mapping from the object. Um, right now, we have only spheres, but if you add uh, um, the quadrix, or if you add a plane or triangles, you would need to find a corresponding mapping from textures onto that surface. So uh, that makes it pretty cool. Uh, allows you to add more complexity to your scene uh, with the just a uh, lookup uh, using this uh, UV parameterization. So then um, we moved on to uh, doing a simple lighting. Um, initially, we had our um, light as a headlight at the origin, or our viewpoint is at the origin also. And then we said, OK, we can have the light anywhere. Um, and what we would do is we would use um, the angle um, between the normal at the hit point and the light location to figure out um, whether um, the point is uh, in the light or not. So, and then depending on that angle, we would choose the intensity uh, of the light. And that gave a nice diffuse effect. And those uh, kinds of objects that kind of depict uh, or behave that way are Lambertian or diffuse, where um, the shading is not dependent on the viewing angle. In general, the shading is dependent on the viewing angle as well as the location of the light. Uh, so it's a more complicated relation. But for uh, diffuse or Lambertian surfaces, uh, it's pretty straightforward. And you just use the cosine of the angle that gives you uh, the relative um, area, essentially. So then we move into more complex material. So I'm, I want to talk a little bit more about um, um, how things behave um, in real life. Uh, so a material usually um, is represented here as a horizontal black line. Uh, it looks kind of nice and smooth to us, uh, even diffuse objects sometimes. Um, what happens in a diffuse object is the incoming light um, reflects back in all directions equally. Uh, and that's what gives us the diffuse appearance. So um, you can imagine, um, like for other kinds of materials, it would be not as diffuse. So if you take a mirror, for example, which is the other extreme of the Lambertian surface, the mirror would have only like one point of exit. And because it's a perfect mirror, uh, it just reflects around that normal. Um, and um, that's, that's how you get the mirror effect. So taking 
all the different kinds of materials that can exist along um, these two extremes. You can imagine something glossy might look a little bit more like mirror, uh, where um, things are going in a single direction, uh, but they are uh, more directed towards. So this would be something like a metal, uh, where you don't see your full reflection in it. I mean, it's glossy, but it's not a mirror. It's like polished, but it's not that much polished that it looks like a mirror. But you see some reflection on it. Um, the images that are reflected back in it may be blurry or fuzzy, uh, but um, it is, um, it's closer to the mirror than to the diffuse surface. So then you can imagine there'll be multiple of these um, um, materials that you can imagine um, something in between, and that is like a plastic um, or some other object. Uh, and things can get complicated. So as we look at it in more detail, so the surface of an object, uh, the object itself is here uh, represented in this gray bar. Um, and the surface, uh, if you look at it microscopically, it's not smooth. It will have these jaggedy little edges. Um, uh, again, at a very small uh, microscopic level. So if you look at light as a whole, then it might um, uh, it, it come in. And uh, when it is shiny object or mirror-like object, um, it, it reflects back in a direction that is kind of uh, in, at the same relative angle to the normal as it came in. Um, and then for diffuse objects, it, it is going to scatter all around. But there may be other kinds of objects, like um, um, like transparent objects, where the light passes through and comes out the other side. And um, uh, this um, creates a different kind of object where it's more like a glass that you see through. Um, and it follows from the uh, Snell's law of, uh, kind of reflection, where you can calculate these things accurately. Um, there may be other kinds of objects, like um, um, for example, skin, where the light comes in, um, it may bounce around the surface and then go out. Um, so it, it, the direction is kind of almost like a little bit unpredictable in a way where the light might go out of. So that's where you get this um, kind of subsurface effects. And those surface effects may are also kind of, because they are view dependent, the closer you are to like a skin surface, the more you see this effect where it's a little bit translucent and you can see through it something like glass of milk or skin. So all those subsurface-like effects um, are also possible. So how do we reconcile all of this? So we had a very simple cosine-based Lambertian surface. But then now that we look at different kinds of surfaces, we can see that there's a large possibility of different kinds of materials. And not only that, but the materials may be even um, combined. So there may be a rusty spot on a shiny sphere. And which means there are like two kinds of um, um, BRDFs kind of combined into one object. So we can think of um, all of this um, in a simpler way. Um, uh, where the incident light uh, is coming in this direction, omega i, and then it goes out in the other direction as omega r. So the relationship is described by this uh, partial differential here. Um, it, it may look complicated, but it's not really. I think it's all it is saying is that um, um, the, uh, the outgoing um, radiance is dependent on both the viewing angle uh, and the uh, and the light position, and um, uh, so if you can see that for the Lambertian, we can kind of simplify it more, where we say that the outgoing direction doesn't matter. So then it's only dependent upon the cosine of the incoming um, or the cosine of the angle from the normal to the light. So um, so I don't want to get into the deeper math of it, but just to give you an idea of intuition of like where the cosine theta comes from um, and um, how it is a specific uh, solution to a more general um, 
equation like this where uh, you can uh, take off this entire thing um, as a factor that is part of the material. So it is a material property um, that um, behaves differently based on the light coming in and the angle you're viewing and um, um, uh, the uh, the normal at the intersection point. So uh, imagine um, having multiple objects that you can then combine. So you can have these multiple uh, lobes, they're called, uh, and you can combine these into making more complex materials. So a material may consist of four or five lobes, and they are um, combined uh, to make up the material. So you can have pretty much any kind of material you want. So then the um, part what uh, Brent was describing was how do we come up with these um, BRDFs at all? So like, um, should we define a BRDF for every single material? Can we have a little bit more general rules for making BRDFs where we define a few and then we can compose and make others based on that? So, so the obvious ones are the metallicness um, and the diffuse ones. So once you have those two kinds of loads, you can combine them in different ways to get other kinds of materials. But there are several others um, uh, that are also useful. So uh, this is um, from um, the Disney BRDF. Um, uh, the BRDFs themselves have um, multiple parameters. So this um, Brent came up with this um, working with the artist because these are the terms that uh, artists kind of understand and they make sense to them. Um, then there may be not a specific mathematical definition for these terms, but they are um, kind of a little bit artistic, a um, little bit more of the vocabulary that the artist would use uh, to define materials. So you can see different values um, from left to right on the x-axis for these parameters and the resulting um, kind of sample of a uh, sphere that how it would look with those different values for each of those parameters. So then you, you combine them in different ways. Um, and one way to combine is to specify values. And you don't have to rely just on values because um, the material can vary um, over the surface. So you can specify them as textures even. So, so imagine texture is not giving you color, but it's giving you the values for these parameters. So you can have these uh, 10 textures and uh, um, paint them however you want to define these properties uh, at different points on your uh, object. And then not only that, but then combine these layers of uh, properties into a single object uh, to basically create any material you want. So, we will try to implement some of this next time. Um, so they can get a little complicated, the units um, in this, um, uh, because you have to uh, do this over the hemisphere. And there is some sampling involved, uh, different kind of sampling where, um, because once you're uh, um, faced with um, this incoming ray and the outgoing ray, you have to figure out like where to, send that reflected ray? Do you send it more in the direction so where you can uh, sample the BRDF more effectively? So that's a little bit of a challenge. And um, that's where the terms like important samplings come from. But um, we're going to do a simplified implementation of some of these parameters and uh, try to see what different kinds of materials we can get. So I'll pause here for some questions. and. Um, Let me know if you have questions, and I look at the chat and see who is being voted for. All right, looks like uh, there are not many questions. So yeah, so this, this today's class is a little bit um, like I want to focus more on the understanding of the BRDFs, and we'll code more next time. Um,
So let's skip the hands-on today. So next time, what we'll do is we will um, define these complex materials. We will uh, try to unify everything um, as well. So then um, you would see that in the spheres that we have, we can create multiple kinds of materials, and you'll have um, um, uh, interesting kinds of materials to work with. Um, So Tiago has a question, like how long um, did it take? So yes, of course I know because I, I was the manager for um, um, Disney Hyperion um, and Brent and the team were working on it. So um, from start to finish, I would say, and Brent, feel free to chime in there because um, there was an incubation period where we had for about a year where um, um, Brent and the team they were uh, trying out different things, and uh, uh, so we just didn't want to go barge into the production and say, here's a renderer, use it, but it's a period of experimentation and research and trying to grow the team as well. So about maybe a year before we started talking to production more seriously about adopting um, the new renderer, so in another maybe uh, six to eight months after that, where uh, we started with the uh, Big Hero Six uh, was the film that we first used it on, and initially we tried one sequence and it looked great. And uh, through partnership with the production, um, we were able to use it for the entire film. And uh, and it's a lot of, um, because when you write a renderer, it's not just a technical thing. You can have the most perfect renderer but you have to be able to use it. And the lighters are the one who are actually going to use the renderer to light up their uh, images. So uh, training the lighters and uh, having a buy-in from the studio all the way from production um, heads to down to the lighters, uh, creating support network for um, all of these things, getting the machines we needed, the render farm. So all that uh, resources and investment into that um, yeah, so the entire thing, maybe less than 16 months, um, we were fully in production with the, from start to finish. All right, so maybe we'll end a little bit early today. If you don't have more questions, um, let me uh, see what the voting thing is uh, for, let me do a quick count here. Uh, da, 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 432, 444. Four, four. So most of them, I think, are more words for the four. Let's see what the Four. The four looks awesome. So uh, I think it, part of it is because um, uh, they're using um, a different renderer. Um, so it, it looks nicer because of um, the kind of materials they're able to use and they have uh, a better shading than what we have now in our renderer. So I want you to be a little bit more objective and make sure, like, imagine if this was a simpler um, Thing. But I like that they are able to create all the um, all the different quadrics, um, so that's pretty neat. And um, I really like personally the creature walking around on the surface of the sphere, uh, and I also like the like lighting effects. As uh, simplistic our lighting is, um, the snowman uh, looks pretty cool, it's pretty dramatic uh, with the simple things that we have so far. Uh, and I also like the moving implementation of um, just solids running around, converting from one quadric to another. Uh, I like them all. Uh, what the heck? I'll, I'll, like Maybe I'll send a book to all of them. So if you are listening, uh, send me your address to whatever format is uh, workable with you. And if you are in the United States, I'm not going to ship book uh, outside of the United States. Uh, but uh, send me your address, and I'll see if I can uh, get NVIDIA to send you the ray tracing gems book. Also, 
Great work. So yeah, continue developing um, more intuition around like how you can make a complex scene and with the um, um, I mean, the easy way is to just list everything out, and that's um, one way to do it. And creating things procedurally is, is is a different kind of art form where you can make things and place them and move them in a way where you can't like you you're not doing hand drawn animation. If you are able to create things procedurally. Um, you can create a lot of complexity that, is, um, that can be very quick. All right, so let's end today at this point and um, we'll do a lot more coding. And um, so in essence, basically now I've explained to you what everything is about um, ray tracing, the basics of it. Um, the easy things are done, and a little bit of um, the BIDF of math we will do, and, and then we'll try to see if we can make things more efficient. So right now, um, I've focused on writing source codes. We can make small changes and evolve, so you don't have to rewrite every every class. So um, that's what the focus of the code has been so far. So um, as we go along, uh, we'll then in the later class, try to make it as efficient as possible. So you can then add more complexity and you can have progressive rendering and all those nice things that you see in commercial renders. All right, so thank you again. And thank you to our guest for being with us. And I will talk to you next week. So next week, we have only one class. So we'll give the volunteer moderators a break a little bit. So we'll meet again next week. Um, but in the meantime, just to practice with your scenes and uh, try to understand a little bit more of the BRDFs, go follow Brent's links or other places where you can find more about the BRDFs. Um, At SIGGRAPH 2020, more than 10,000. I'm sorry. Uh, we have a question about acceleration structures. So we're not going to cover acceleration structures in this course, but I'll talk about them a little bit. Um, because they are important. I think as, as you have heavier and heavier scenes, they will become important. So we are never going to get to, in this course, like that level of complexity with the number of um, items that we will have. Um, but for um, when, when you have a uh, renderer which needs to handle lots of geometry, especially when you go with the triangles and triangle intersections, you pretty much will have like millions of triangles. So we will talk about acceleration structures. And uh, when we talk to um, um, talk, talk to the optics person who will be here, and they will talk about how they are implemented in uh, RTX and um, uh, optics. Um, uh, and then we'll also talk about basic implementation of a uh, some kind of a BVH called the bounding volume hierarchies. All right. Thank you. At SIGGRAPH 2020, more than 10,000 individuals from 95 countries gathered virtually to experience over 350 hours of content presented by more than 1,600 contributors. What resulted was pure SIGGRAPH. Robotic advances use subtractive fabrication techniques to carve foam and similar materials like an artist. Modeling and predictive computation creates a more robust and accurate time stepping of nonlinear elastodynamics. New investigation into damage simulation could change the landscape of video and game effects as well as surgical training. Novel healthcare technologies point toward new ways to transform and enhance lives. Research will help users to create reprogrammable multicolor textures made from a single material. AI-driven technology pushes the capabilities of crowd simulation. Award-winning animation showcases the latest in computer graphics. Real-time and gaming technology advancements transform interactive storytelling techniques and explore new applications of the technology. Evocative digital artwork uses machine learning to create visceral experiences. Now is the time to share your research, your innovations, and your creative inspiration. SIGGRAPH is your community, and we hope you'll share your work with SIGGRAPH 2021.